I'm John Macomber. I'm a finance professor at Harvard Business School, and I'm here because it's so important to think about ways to innovate, to think about uh, slowing climate change, but also to think about climate adaptation. What I look at is adaptation, because it sure looks like there's going to be more floods, more wildfires, more sea rise, more drought, more extreme heat. What are we going to do? Like batteries and, and wind and solar are all good, but it's not enough. We have to think of other actions going forward. Most of the actions I look at are in terms of thinking about individual assets and people, about whether situations call for reinforcements, call for rebounding from something happening, call for restricting development, call for relocating people, or call for planning to rebuild. So in the physical world, this could think about uh, floods or fire that might burn houses or destroy bridges. In the individual world, it's more thinking about public health and ways that people get ill from wildfire smoke, from extreme heat, from mold, from all these kind of things. So the idea is, how do you think in a a planned way about what interventions make sense and what don't. There's so many choices you could do. So what interests me is the concept of risk and the concept of readiness. So depending on where you live or what you're exposed to, you might have seismic or flood or heat or wildfire risk. And depending on if it's your house, different levels of readiness against seismic or against flood or against heat. Well, how do you think about what risks are? You can look at climate models, you can look at probabilities, you can look at projections, which now are quite good, they never used to be, and you think about where it's effective to spend some money to harden the house or not. Similarly, you can think about if my kid has breathing problems and I'm downstream from a lot of wildfire smoke, what are we gonna do about this next time there's a wildfire? So it's almost all looking at likelihoods or probabilities of events and thinking about the benefit cost of spending money to either avoid the events or think how to handle them when they occur or think how to bounce back after they happen. This has really changed in the last year or two. There are now a number of, of public sources that look at, a num at various climate projections and blend them together. So one is a commercial real estate broker called Redfin, and they've decided that their brokerage model is going to be full disclosure, and they'll help people look at the level of risk that their, their plot has. They can't look help you look at the level of readiness that your structure has, they can look at the level of risk. They use public information from a group called First Street Foundation, which is similar to a group called Probable Futures, both of whom see it as their civic duty to be not-for-profits who compile this information and make it available to homeowners. Sure, the websites can do that, uh, looking at the, um, the outdoor air quality or the wildfire risk or the drought risk, Redfin's doing that now, probably other brokers will have to follow, and they're using information, as I said, from, from not-for-profit uh, charitable sources. The other thing that's really different now that what didn't exist three or four years ago is the onset of sensors and wearables. So now people have Fitbits or Apple Watches. There's also hundreds of indoor air quality monitors and outdoor air quality monitors that are inexpensive that can give you real-time, time series information about temperature and humidity, but also carbon dioxide, particulates, and volatile organic compounds. And this information is shared out in the open cloud, so people, citizens, are compiling information about wildfire plumes, or about whether an apartment building is healthy, or about whether an employer has a healthy workplace. This completely flips the power dynamic of who has the information about the risk, both to public health or to damage, from into the hands of the citizens and away from the hands of people who had it. A, a lim a, uh, who had control of that information. So this really flips the negotiating dynamic. It used to be that the, the big banks or the big building owners were the ones who had the information about air quality. They had industrial hygienists. They're the ones who had information from some seismic chart. They're the ones who had information about our air quality. What has flipped now is this is in the hands of citizens. Citizens have their own monitors around seismic, there are monitors around indoor air quality, there are monitors around outdoor air quality, even wearables are looking at your blood pressure and your pulse and your skin temperature. And all that information can be shared from citizens into the open data cloud so that people can think of networks that look at these trends and they can give information about what they think of various buildings, employers, situations in ways that were never available at the, the person by person level before. If you think of, of indoor air quality in terms of your work environment or your home, it's quite easy now to have a new air quality monitor. I have four, actually, in various places. And you can look at the key measures of, of temperature, humidity, particulates, carbon dioxide, and volatile organic compounds. And many of those can be mitigated with relatively simple measures, usually involving open the windows, run the fans, run the filters. Often we don't do that because we've been so trained to think about energy efficiency lately. But energy efficiency often means bad air. And 
my a revelation really as a building environment person, having t spent years and years taking, tasting energy savings, is that the energy savings might be worth pennies, but the health savings or the more cognitive benefits of having cleaner air are worth dollars or tens of dollars. So really, you can balance the uh, a little bit of need to keep the building tight and save some energy versus a big need to have fresh air or filtration and uh, have healthier air for you and your children and uh, really how your brain works, both at your office and at home in a situation you might be in now or if you're thinking about renting an apartment or buying a condominium where you might want to go.